watch the skyline of San Diego as the ship pulls out of the harbor and heads north. The crew are all back on board after their last liberty for quite a while, and our modern Navy icebreaker embarks on a long trip to a strange and distant land. These sailors are lashing down cargo for a voyage that few ships have ever taken, a voyage never dreamed of by travel agencies. Let's find out more about this unusual trip. This officer looks too busy to talk. But here we are on the bridge, and here is the skipper himself pouring over his charts. Now, perhaps we can get some information about where we are going. Here, northwestward from San Diego, is the route we have taken so far. We will go to Kodiak Island, then around the tip of the Alaskan Peninsula, and north to St. Lawrence Island. From there, the icebreaker will proceed to King Island, the northernmost point to be visited on this trip. This is the Navy's annual winter reconnaissance of ice conditions in the Bering Sea. And we will see a lot more of this, and rougher, too. This grim-faced sailor is the helmsman. The captain's orders tell him what course to steer. In calm weather, the helmsman's job is... But steering an icebreaker through rough water and ice, whether by wheel or the follow-up system, as here, takes a thoroughly trained, experienced, and responsible man. We get a rough ride as the icebreaker plows her way through these heavy seas. Later on, when even part of the surface of the ocean is covered with ice, the ship will roll less and the going will be smoother. Today we head into Woman's Bay for our first stop, a very brief one, at Kodiak Island, home of the famous Kodiak Bears in the Gulf of Alaska. We get our first glimpse of the Naval Air Station. These are the living quarters for Naval personnel. And beyond the water, we see the airfield and the hangars. This collection of small houses makes up the residential section of Kodiak, surrounded by the beauty of nature's handiwork. We stopped only briefly and left promptly. And here we have company a submarine pulling out of the bay ahead of us. One reason for our stop at Kodiak was to take on equipment, specifically a helicopter, standard equipment for icebreakers in the Arctic. Ours is being lashed down securely because we are getting into rough water, although so far these heavy seas aren't giving the icebreaker, or the submarine either, much difficulty. It's not only rougher, it's colder too. And on the after deck house, and practically every other exposed part of the ship, we have a new problem. Ice has formed. And now begins the never-ending war, waged by the deckhands of any ship going through open water in the Arctic region. If this picturesque lily pad ice were the only ice the sailors had to contend with, life on an icebreaker would be easier. This is a very early stage in ice field formation. Meanwhile, off at the left, we glimpse the submarine. She's put on a heavy winter coat. We will be saying goodbye to her now, for she's not going farther with us. She is turning back south. Our own ship, the Burton Island, is only a 6,000 tonner, but she boasts an elaborate distillation apparatus for converting seawater into fresh water to ensure the ship always having a plentiful supply. This is only one of her many facilities for self-sustained, comfortable living. For example, the bunks, roomier than on most Navy ships, as every sailor will see. And here are the washrooms, hot and cold running water, and showers. Compared with early Arctic explorations made in the old whaling ships, our trip is going to be downright luxurious. What a handsome beaver. We don't blame you for taking good care of it, sailor. Now it's chow time. Let's see. In the far north, a man needs more body energy, hence more food to keep warm. Above the Arctic Circle, the Navy increases food rations by 25%. Now we'll continue our tour by looking in at sick bay. Yes, there's a full-fledged dentist aboard and even a dental x-ray machine. 
The Burton Island, like all the Navy's icebreakers, must be entirely self-sufficient despite her small size. You see, an icebreaker operates alone in remote Arctic regions for long periods of time. She cannot radio a nearby big ship and say, transferring patient for treatment. There isn't any nearby big ship. That's why plenty of medical and dental officers and corpsmen must be right on board. Not only medical skill, but equipment, too, must be there. This sailor was slightly injured in the engine room, and the portable x-ray machine will help the doctor diagnose his injury accurately. This is the laundry. Here we have the pieces of up-to-date equipment, a power presser, as well as a power ironer, and an automatic washer that take the slavery out of the chores of keeping clean do a lot for the crew's morale, too. Another morale booster, especially on long cruises, is the ship's store, larger and more complete than on most small Navy ships. Proceeding on northward alone, we leave lily pad ice far behind now and move into the region of larger ice fields. And walrus. Playful creatures, aren't they, considering that they weigh up to 4,000 pounds apiece. The ice is much thicker now. Obviously, it must be to hold these big fellows. On board, we watch the icebreaker and admire the business-like way she pushes through the ice. Another sign that the weather is colder is the heavy coat of ice on our railing. Ahead, we see St. Lawrence Island, largest island in the northern Bering Sea. We've now almost reached our most northern point. After a brief stop here, we will push on northwestward. A welcoming committee is on hand from Sabunga, one of the two Eskimo villages on the island. They're pleased with our invitation to come aboard. Mixed with their cordiality and pleasure is curiosity, of course, about the big ship and her crew. The women of the party climb to the bridge and smile down at the camera. Out there, in what we might call the Eskimos parking lot, their transportation waits patiently. Now it is time for the visitors to leave. They have invited some of the crew to go sightseeing around St. Lawrence Island. The captain and a few others decide to accept this hospitable offer, and off they go on a cold ride. The exchange of courtesies over, the men come back, and we are ready to shove off. Underway once more, we leave St. Lawrence behind and head northeast. The ice is heavier now, but our powerful engines drive the ship through easily. We are in a sort of groove where the ice field has cracked and refrozen. The ship breaks her way through without any trouble. Nothing we encounter seems even to give the Burton Island an argument. But now the ice becomes still heavier, and the icebreaker is slowed down at last and finally stop. On the starboard wing of the bridge, the skipper stops the screws. The ice finally gave her an argument. Only temporarily, however, first step is to look for an easy way out. This is the helicopter's job. It warms up the territory to going on a search for a better lead in the ice. The copter will cover a several mile radius, examining our surroundings. No promising leads yet. But this prominent Arctic citizen looks as though he needs some exercise. For our cameraman and for us spectators, chasing a polar bear by helicopter is great fun. But the polar bear probably does not share our enthusiasm. The helicopter comes back, reporting no lead can be found. So the engines must take over. In the engine room, sailors begin lighting off more engines to generate more power get the ship loose and force her through the ice. An icebreaker has 10,000 diesel electric horsepower with very large, heavy, slow-turning propellers. In a certain respect, she is like a bulldozer. She is capable of developing maximum thrust at practically zero speed of advance. One of the techniques of icebreaking is to back down, as the Burton Island is doing here. Now the captain starts the screws again. Forward this time to ram the ice. 
Gradually, the icebreaker moves ahead, slowly at first. It looks as though, yes, this time we're going to make it. Now we can look down and watch the ship push the big pieces of ice aside in her casual, easy way. Now we approach the high point of our trip, King Island. The two square miles of rocky mountain top that is King Island lies just south of Alaska's westernmost tip. And here's a friendly welcoming committee waiting eagerly for our arrival. They have come down from their village, this collection of precariously perched houses, to welcome the strangers and the big boat that leans against the ice, as the Eskimos describe our ship. We lower the gangway and secure it onto the ice shelf. And some of the villagers start coming aboard, taking advantage of our invitation to visit the ship. They're happy to see us, the first ship ever to pay them a visit in midwinter. The priest, the village leader, and the two school teachers all arrive eager for news from the States. These Eskimos differ somewhat from those we met earlier. For instance, these women wait on shore with the children until the men have been on board the strange new boat and can assure their women folk that it is safe. These kindly people will dispense their best hospitality when we climb the steep path and pay the little village a visit. We look at a skin boat laid up for the winter, at the different little houses and on the clotheslines, at the items of cloth with which the Eskimos supplement their fur clothing. In this house is a shortwave radio, which explains how the village knew we were coming and declared a holiday. We look down at the icebreaker, waiting for the return of her crew. The sight reminds us that it is time to go. We are sorry to leave. King Island's hospitality has been pleasant. Sailors and officers have all had a good time, and so have our hosts. Our visit has been a welcome break in their long winter and an important event in their lives. No one has minded the 15 below zero weather, and everyone, with or without sleds, could have fun sliding downhill. We'll take time, before we leave, to fish through the ice for the famous king crab. Because of the rich plant life of the Arctic waters, these crabs, like all forms of animal life, grow much larger here in the far north, making it a real fisherman's paradise. Heading south, we look back on King Island, one of the most unusual spots ever visited by sailors of the United States Navy. Thank you.